Well, thanks for joining this session. So this is a, um, a short discussion for the next 30 minutes on an interesting area of operational resiliency. It's an area that's really growing within our industry, within our customer base, both in financial services as well as non-financial services. Um, and, you know, it's an, it's an aspect that's um, getting a lot of attention from different, uh, for different reasons, including from a regulatory perspective. Um, in the UK, we have PRA in Europe, Dora, as Gaurav mentioned in the opening session, as well as the US, all having different standards and different requirements, which kind of can confuse the situation even further. Um, but also, consumers um, and investors are um, demanding uh, our organizations to be a lot more resilient as well. Um, today, I'm joined by my panelists here today. Um, so, we'll just qu quickly introduce uh, Chandra Shekhar, who's the Chief Audit Executive for Mizzou Bank. Um, we have Jacqueline, Jackie McDonald, the CIO for Barclays. Um, and we have Haliza Barum from uh, Petronas, the national energy company in Malaysia. Um, so we're just going to cover a couple of key aspects and just have a discussion around those areas because it is very broad. And what we want to do today was just get some perspectives um, from, from yourselves uh, on these different areas. So if I, if I can start with really around data, um, it's, it's an area that a lot of our clients are struggling with, I suppose. Um, and we know that organizations are developing, have large data sets around risks and controls and libraries which they develop over time, um, gathering huge amounts of data that can really limit the um, effectiveness of the resiliency programs themselves. Um, how can organizations rationalize these data sets so they improve the efficiency of those programs and that can fuel the effectiveness of the resiliency program. Um, Holly, so maybe from a, an energy Patronus perspective, maybe you have some thoughts on that first. All right, thank you so much. Um, it's a difficult question. You mentioned that uh, I get nervous already. I'm like <laughs> suddenly picturing what Patronus is as an organization. Uh, just to recap a bit, to give a brief background of uh, what Patronus is as an organization so that it gives a better context on what I'm going to explain and share about what's happening in Petronas. So uh, we, we operate in more than 100 countries. Uh, we have business in energy, shipping, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, of course, have to adhere to a lot of uh, regulations, laws in all countries, in different types of industries. We have more than 50,000 employees, close to 600 group of companies. So you can imagine how, what kind of data that goes around in Petronas, right? That's why it scares me when I get that kind of question. Let me try to answer the question. Um, I'm only sharing from the perspective of Petronas, where I am, based on the experience that I've had so far. Not saying that it's the best practice uh, or it has been working well. Uh, of course, we are always growing, learning uh, what are the gaps, what works for us, and what doesn't work. So, so far, what we have, um, there's a lot of data going around, you know, data in the operation, business, laws, uh, regulation, all sorts of data. Uh, and it's everywhere, like I mentioned, because we have um, close to 600 companies and different business segments and this, uh, different corporate uh, 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 specialists and areas. So it's not that we, are not we were not managing our data, but it was managed in silos. Everyone had their processes, governance within their own uh, companies or units. Uh, but uh, back in early 2020, uh, Petronas realized that it needs to be a data-driven organization because it's, it's really important, right? Data is the new oil, they said back in 2020. And it still is. So what uh, Petronas did uh, uh, at the enterprise level, uh, they, they established a, a unit uh, to manage data in terms of uh, making sure uh, that everyone within Petronas is managing their data in an aligned and streamlined processes. Uh, so this uh, department uh, that, that is in charge of manage, uh, ma making sure that everyone follows the same governance, uh, po uh, policies, processes, and system across Petronas, uh, they develop what is known as uh, PDF, Petronas Data Framework which was rolled out to all uh, the business and also companies. So that is to streamline. 
and to inculcate uh, self-governance within the companies and also the uh, corporate units. So it was rolled out and it's still being adopted. Of course, again, I said there's gaps. There's, of course, adoption is always a big issue, right? Making sure that people adopt. Um, and it's an ongoing process. Uh, so so when, when we talk about, uh, um, when you mentioned rationalizing all these data sets, because there's so many different data sets, right? Uh, because the, the, the companies and the uh, corporate units are empowered uh, to, to uh, uh, develop their own data sets, um, it's still not integrated in a sense. We are still uh, going towards that. It's an objective that we're going towards too. Uh, and and I, I would like to say that we are on the right path. Uh, when we are going to reach it, I'm uh, not sure yet. <laughs> um, but what I can say is that uh, because we have gone through pandemic, uh, volatile oil price, oil price was really low, and you can still see Petronas is here. We are the one of the uh, top Fortune 500 by revenue in the uh, Fortune 500 list. So it just shows that we are quite resilient in that sense. And I would like to think that uh, we managing our data has helped us to still be here. Yeah. Uh, and and I would like to think it for, uh, to to look at it from a layman perspective. Because when you talk about data, to me, it's two things. Um, availability of relevant quality data. So that's, that's as long as we stick to that and all of our processes and how we manage data is towards that objective, I would like to think that uh, that would guide us in the right direction. Great, yes. great. fantastic. Jackie, we know that you've been going through a transformation over at Barclays. Any, any perspectives in terms on of the data. on the data side through that transformation? Um, well, similar to Petronas, I think uh, Barclays has a vast amount of data. And we aspire to be a data-led company. I think that's something that everybody is aspiring to these days. Uh, and we recognize the power of data, but we also recognize that our data can be very disparate and it can be quite um, structured in very many, many different systems and governed in different ways. So similar, we have, a, we have a data governance program. We're a bank, we like governance. We like programs that manage governance and we'll put all of that in place and that's in place. And it's, it's given us a, a really clear understanding of how data runs front to back through all of our important business services and how we can see all the horizontals through there. And that's actually given us a great grounding. I think the challenge that we have, and particularly for my part of the world, so I'm the, the CIO for group finance and technology for controls. So I have to look at it in a slightly different perspective. I look at SOX controls, and I look at the data that flows through that from a financial perspective, and then I look at it on how do we manage all of our risk event data and our management data in the right spaces. Where is that captured across compliance? How does it feed through? So we have spent quite a lot of time looking at the legacy systems that we have. It was interesting listening to the Nordia presentation because um, I can rec uh, certainly relate to the multiple disparate systems and trying to bring it into the one area. I don't know how we would get to a position where we say to all of our Barclays businesses, you do one thing in the one way. And <laughs> it's a huge aspiration to do, but I don't think we'll do it. But from a data perspective, um, Understanding our data and how they relate to all of our critical business services has been a key thing. Understanding where our data is and how it's all governed and make sure that it's all in a common place and, we, and it's following a common, a common framework. But then it's how do you rationalize it? How do you simplify it? And how do you see where your single sources of data are and where they're not replicated? And that's one of the biggest challenges that we're going through as we upgrade into our Sort of risk and control framework systems because we've got a lot of legacy systems that we're going, we're going to decommission, but we've also got a core system that's been running for about eight years that has been customized significantly and it's got a huge amount of processes round about it that, that feed off of manual sets of data. Um, it's, a, it's a bigger exercise than I think we originally anticipated, looking at how we rationalize it. Um, but it's absolutely key to the understanding of how we get to a framework that is more uniform across the whole of the bank that, ra that manages risk data. 
and for, for all our non-financial risk. And whilst we know that that's what we look to aspire to, huge amounts of our organisation like to do things their own way, and we are pushing that through. It's a, it's a challenge, though, and I don't... Back to you, I mean, I, I think you get in a cold sweat when you talk about <laughs> data in its entirety across non sort of non-financial risk data that's the way it's held in a large company like ours. Yeah. And Chandra, maybe some of your challenges around data, but specifically, you know, how it's supporting your resiliency program. I think um, in terms of data, I think, the, you know, it's used very loosely. What is data? What is critical data? What matters to us and why should we care? I think that needs to be set uh, right at the beginning, you know, and why should we care? And that should drive what we do with the data. Uh, so from, from that point of view, when you're talking about NFR and then when we're looking at resilience and six-stage rules and, you know, there are plenty. Uh, so when we look at the whole framework, I think data plays a key role, um, KRIs, KPIs, whatever you want to call them. I think what is key and what is critical to the business, what do we care about, that is what needs to be defined first and then things can go from there. So what is the golden source of truth? I know, for instance, you know, there are a couple of banks, no one has a silver bullet, just so if you're listening, a couple of banks which have uh, all singing, all dancing, front to back system, which looks at booking, risk management, position management, etc. But we currently... Okay. Um, okay, hopefully you can hear me better. Um, so as I was saying, there are only a couple of banks, um, without naming them, who have designed a front-to-back flow. But if you look at resilience, almost everyone, I think Jackie mentioned legacy, almost all banks have legacy apps. Um, almost all banks have disparate apps. And um, um, there are users, end-user developed applications. Um, so there are plenty of them, and they are all interlinked. Now, if you look at, um, uh, you know, MIFID II, um, and uh, RTS 6 and 8, uh, and if you look at um, PRA guidelines, or if you look at um, SR 11.7, a lot of it relate to models and data and how they flow, what happens to that data, and then what we do with it. And all of it you need for resilience, especially for banks, which has customer data, transaction data, you know, uh, so it is very, very important. So I'll go back to the basics and say, what is critical for us? Let's define it. Who owns it? Let's define it. And, you know, as I think just before us, there was this accountability and responsibility. Within the UK, I, am, I think pretty much you're aware of the senior manager functions, which fixes accountability and responsibility. So who owns it? Who takes care of that data? And how do we process that? What decisions or what key decisions we use um, based on that data? I think once that is set right and recorded properly, um, I think when we come to the third line, more often than not when I look at ops resilience or when my team looks at it, the fundamental thing is what is a critical business process? Some have defined 10, some banks, and some banks have defined 500. So where is the proper medium? Where do we get the right balance? I think that is very important. And that's why I go back to basics saying, what do we care and why do we care? And that needs to be defined and everything flows. I think then you can build resilience around it so that the thing that you care most about uh, or the thing that could cause you a lot of reputational damage, you safeguard that and build resilience. I think that's how you, you approach that. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. I, li I, li I like that perspective of defining up front and working that through. Um, so let, let's change the direction a little bit to kind of the whole integrated risks, um, something that Gora mentioned right at the beginning. Um, so we now know that kind of you know, operational resiliency is, is you know, these programs are um, considering different aspects of op risk, third party risk management, business continuity, um, and other, other functions in different areas. Um, what strategies are you developing in your organization to bring this together from an integrated risk perspective that supports the overall resiliency of the organization and your, and your frameworks? Uh, Jack, maybe you want to start? It's a really hard topic, that one actually. We were talking about it earlier on. Um, 
Traditionally, it's easy to bring controls and operational risks together and, and expand it out and think about third party risk. There are some areas which are more difficult to bring in, in particular cyber risk, predominantly because cyber is seen as something that's very specific. Yeah. But, the, but the, the reality is it's the non-financial risk of the bank. Cyber just happens to be something that's really important right at this point in time. And it all f comes back into the resilience question. Do you have enough resiliency mm -hmm. in your organization to be able to recover from whatever sort of system a uh, situation you happen to be in or the scenario that you're in. So from a Barclays point of view, we do have um, very senior forums that run all the risk, the non-financial risk, who come together and look at it very carefully. We are looking at our uh, resilience programs and our cyber programs on how we can sort of merge more of that together. But right now they have got very specific outcomes that they're pushing for and they're driving that in, in the right way for the bank. But what we're doing with the operational risk upgrades that we're doing with to M7 is actually looking at where are the things that we can deliver right now that's part of our current infrastructure and what do we want to bring in in the future? So will we look at cyber and resilience um, a little bit more closely to our operational risk framework? We are doing that. So there's a lot of senior people understanding the, the challenges um, we're looking at how the data all flows and making sure that risk events are managed in all the right way and we've got one common framework that supports all of that. Um, to get to a position where we've got everything together as a fully integrated solution, I think it's going to take us a few years yet. Yeah. Um, but there is a willingness and a recognition that it's a requirement now. Um, it's, sometimes it's a little bit harder to pull some of the teams who are very special into <laughs> the environment <laughs> that we... The special ones, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 they do have a very specific environmental challenge, but recognising that it's in the same challenge as everybody else is where we are. We just need to pull them in at the right time. Yeah. But from a senior oversight perspective, I think everybody recognises that it is all in the same vein. And what we need to build with our sort of like new version is that future proofing so that you have got a fully connected environment in the future. It isn't there just now, but there is an aspiration to get there. It's just at the right time. Yeah. And Holly, from a, an energy, a global energy perspective, I can imagine how, how much of a mammoth task that is to try yeah. to develop, work towards a, a fully integrated yeah. risk uh, environment. But some of the, some of the perspectives from your organization? Um, uh, uh, within Petrodas, similarly like Barclays, we do have like um, management oversight of all the risk areas. There are, uh, in Petronas, we have identified 12 focus risk areas. And what, one of it is uh, legal and regulatory. We have HSC, we have cyber, uh, we have finance, uh, 12, 12 areas, can't remember all. <laughs> um, so so uh, every quarter, uh, we have risk management committee, all the key members from all the 12 focus risk areas would sit together and go through all the risk areas. And this is where I think uh, they would able to see the overall risk, how one risk is correlated to another because everyone is there and all the risk areas are being presented. So that's one way where we try to connect everyone that, that is in charge or, or you know, a custodian of all these 12 focus risk areas. That's one way. Uh, the sec second way that I think uh, is actually the mapping of the risk towards the, you know, the, the, the effect of the risk. When it's done, uh, when, when that exercise is done properly, you can actually see what are the areas of risk that actually play, play a role you know, in, in certain areas, like, like for example, legal and regulatory. We're, we are not uh, in silo because cyber is part of it, so system and all that, finance, reputational and all that. So it's, it's actually interconnected. But the challenge in Petronas is actually, uh, because it's massive, you imagine how many controls have been rolled out in each of these 12 areas. So like for legal and regulatory, we've rolled out 170 plus control. That's just us. The other 11, I'm not sure how many they have, right? So to align it, uh, to make sure there are no redundant controls, because I'm sure there's one control that can cut across every single thing, like maybe they have technology, right? System and all that. That should cater for uh, certain activities that are similar. But we, we are trying to do that. I think the first step that we're doing at the moment is actually to engage all these other risk uh, areas, uh, example cyber. We are, we are just engaging and, and sharing with them what we do 
so that they understand that there are similarities. So this, it's just to start off with having more engagement rather than like we treat them like a special child. <laughs> we actually try to get together more and to also understand HAC risk, how, how are they being managed, uh, financial risk, on, and all this. It's a lot of work. It's like I remember Michael was mentioning just now, you look at the forest and the tree, but we have to also look at the branches and the leaves, right, in order to connect everything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, from perspective. Yeah, I, can, I can imagine the just getting internal alignment is a bigger challenge than just the technology itself. And um, Chandra, from your perspective, any key strategies to help drive within your organization that interconnected risk? I think um, more often than not, people forget um, that uh, within a bank, there's this, this is my fiefdom, this is my kingdom, the, the silo mentality, and that runs across. And that's a very dangerous thing because when you're talking about interconnected risks, and when you're talking about idiosyncratic risks, for instance, cyber was mentioned, um, you know, for instance, models risk is another critical risk for a bank. Um, but the, the people who take care of them typically uh, for those of you who are in any of these ages, please don't take offense, but they are normally geeks. They do not want to interact with other functions. And this whole thing of breaking the silos and agreeing a common risk taxonomy, a common risk hierarchy, how we work together. I think when we talk about operational resilience, at the top level, yes, they do sit together, they understand it, but again, the politics of it plays out differently. The working together at a couple of levels below never happens. And um, for us, I think as a strategy, that's why we have said, you're not special, you're not doing anything extraordinary, we are all here as part of the bank, so let's get together, drop our egos at our desk, and put together a working plan together on how these things are interconnected and how they can play out um, in, you know, if they were to be realized in, uh, in real life. I think that has happened um, in the organization, and that is when the penny dropped, and a lot of things, activities are happening as a result. So the single risk taxonomy, the single risk hierarchy have all been established and agreed, and that has been passed down to the you know, couple of levels, to middle, middle management even. And then that is where actually the magic begins, and they work together and they get all these together. So there's the top down and also the bottom up. The culture plays a big role uh, within the thing. And I think given it's a Japanese bank, the culture of humility, service to uh, our customers has played a big role in getting agreement on, on these things. We are still a couple of years away from getting an integrated solution, but we have done a lot of work in that um, area, especially agreeing the hierarchy and the interconnectedness, that then you know all these other things can fall into place. Yeah. China, you, you're touching the tones of um, what uh, Jacob was talking about from Nordia in the previous session, which is using the stick and the carrot there, which I think <laughs> is, uh, seems to be working well for yourself. Um, you, you all three of you, you mentioned um, a third area, which I wanted to quickly just touch on while we have some time, but you actually just touched on it just this then. It's really around kind of the whole digitization um, and we're seeing that there's obviously a big, big focus now in these organizations around digitization, but also how we're still seeing that culture of how information security and cyber teams are still um, fairly separated and in their own little island, their own little world, and that doesn't lean towards this whole vision of um, res you know, overall organizational resiliency and integrated risk aspects. Um, so maybe a few um, thoughts on what you're doing in your organizations to try and break that down, for whether it's from a, a cultural perspective or a technology perspective or ways of working, because obviously we want to try to get to that, get to that point. Um, Harleza, maybe you want to start with your thoughts? I know I you're passionate about this area. I always question, why are you targeting me? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, bringing them together, I mentioned just now about uh, having more engagement to understand each other's processes, what we do and all that. Um, the, set, the next step, uh, actually, uh, we are using the same platform, the third-party risk uh, metric screen platform. So cybersecurity is using it, and uh, our site legal compliance is also using it uh, to assess our third parties. Um, so, so we did the same uh, uh, when we wanted to procure the system. We we did it together, 
And it was a good practice, although there's, there was a lot of friction. Who, who, whose interest uh, is, is uh, far superior than the other. That was, I think, myself, I have to admit, I also have an ego saying that my, my risk area is in, more important than cybersecurity, and they also have the same. But after a while, we realized that uh, it's, it's professionalized, right, in the end. We have to work together. So that, that exercise, although it was quite painful, but it was a learning experience, each other learning from each other why they are important, why we are important. So at the same time, uh, uh, realizing that each one of us plays a really important role. We are uh, on our own, we are important, but we also have to be together, interconnected, right? because we don't want to uh, expose patronus to any further risk. Uh, so, so that's one step of engaging with each other, uh, getting to know more, uh, each other, and the next step is having the same technology so that, it, like you said, having different, different technology or someone asked question just now, nobody dares to raise their hand right just now in the session. So that's the next step. But of course, having a system, it's, it's not the only thing because you have to yeah. you know, implement the system, making sure that it's adopted. Uh, and you mentioned about customization and all that. Just now we were talking. And, and they also customized for their purposes, and we are customizing for our purposes, but it's the same platform. So that bit is, is the other challenge that we had. So we went through first step, second step, now there's this customization, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. the other thing. So every day we are going through challenges, but I think as long as we keep it together with the intent that we're, we're doing it for the same thing, which is for patronage, I think we, yeah. we can actually do it. But you're using technology to help drive yes. that, uh, yeah. that alignment and that, um, okay, excellent. Yeah. Chan, Chan, from your perspective, any, any thoughts on how you can bring these silos down? I think um, technology is something that all banks use, and there are various technologies, obsolete ones, a lot of them. But I think if you look at the present and the future, many people talk about technology as the big thing for the future. Actually, it, it is, but it is also the big thing for the present. So what banks are today, banks are tech companies lending money. Either we are in that place or we are in that direction. I think from a culture point of view, we need to change the understanding or the, the mindset of people that innovation, technology, digitalization is, is now, is the present, is where we need to be, and is where we need to be better at in the near future. I think only then, that kind of brings the uh, digitalization, um, you know, makes it fruitful. Uh, from, from a CEO's point of view, our bank CEO introduced a fresh set of values of which he, he, you know, he put a lot of emphasis on innovation, problem solving, because both of these are interlinked to di digitalization. Again, there is no point in you being in your own silo and building your own application and trying to link it with others, but work together and get that across. So from that point of view, again, bringing it back to risk, um, we have agreed a common application, a common system that records it all, uh, the KRIs, the operational losses, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a lot of it uh, is centralized, so single source of truth. It's very easy for me to say, oh, this is the golden source, but in the bank you will have 120 golden sources, and what do you do with them? How do you know what is linked to where and what you find where? I think with our case, because of how Mizuho was set up and how we acquired other, you know, other banks, brokerage firms, etc., we have our own uh, set of challenges on the digitalization journey, but given the attitude or the tone at the top and how it has changed the culture, um, I think we will get to see more fruits um, uh, you know, in the re near future. But the fact that we have come across as an organization to have one uh, common platform for risk, um, recognition, rev uh, you know, uh, risk, um, uh, and also risk metrics, um, it's, it's a, a very important step, I would say. And Jackie, is this a challenging uh, bar case for yourself? Yeah, it is. And I think back to what we said at the very beginning, understanding data and making sure that we, under, you, we really understand data linked to all of our critical business services. 
making sure that that common taxonomy is understood across all the different lines who think that they have a something different. Um, I think the, a system and an application is, is only one part of it. We are really looking at how does it interconnect all over the place, but things like cyber in the digitization space, AI, ML, how that's coming through, how that links into model risk. As long as we've got a current, uh, a common taxonomy that we all understand, the oversight is at the top. A system, a single system isn't necessarily something that we're all going to aspire to. We've got a core system that will hold our operational risk, we'll use our metrics off of. Other systems will integrate to them because they are right for their product and for their particular risk events. So model risk is not something that we would involve in some of the areas, but we'll record the risk events about it. So that common taxonomy, understanding of the data, and then the right use of the technology underneath it is the things that we are looking at because it's a, it is a complex environment. I think we're out of time. Um, so we really appreciate your contributions and your, and your time today. Um, our panelists are around for the rest of the day. If there's any questions and you want to address any areas that we've talked about today, um, maybe we can have a quick round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.